Um, personally, I don't need gimmicks to be interesting. So there's no games, there's no silliness like that. I will just tell you um, what you need to know because Vitaly is saying we should push our creativity, we should do new things, we should be creative, and we've seen some amazing stuff over the last couple of days, but there is a fundamental flaw that we need to get clients and our bosses and management to approve all of this stuff. And so that is what I want to talk to you about. And they say when you give a good presentation, you should always start with a real kind of humdinger, a, a takeaway, something to inspire. But instead of that, I want to start with something that's blindingly obvious and is staring every single one of us in the face. And that is that companies uh, uh, that we work with for and the clients that we work with need to change. They need to do things differently. And we kind of know this. We know that they need to become more user-centric. Everybody in this room knows that. We know that these companies need to start embracing design thinking and doing it differently. We heard a great talk yesterday, didn't we, about processes and different ways of working, that we should be agile and we should work in the, you know, with these different workflows. But getting people to agree to that kind of stuff is hard. Now, we know that it makes a big difference. In 2010, a $10,000 investment in a design-centric company would yield returns of 228% greater than the rest of the market. Wow! And I'm sure that when the um, Design Management Institute came up with that number, they weren't at all biased in any way, being a design institute. But it does show that, in fact, design has a huge impact on the success of companies. And we know all of this, don't we? We also know things like this, that 89% of retail customers have said they will or have stopped doing business with a company after a single poor customer experience. The work we do matters. It provides a great experience, it excites people, it makes them loyal, it makes them enthusiastic about our brand. And Tim Cook at Apple put it beautifully when he said, most business models are focused on self-interest rather than creating a great experience. So we're all about creating great experiences, aren't we? And there are companies out there that get it. General Electric's is a, a great example of a company that's doing a huge amount with design. IBM at the moment is trying to hire 12,000 designers. So if you are a really shitty designer sitting in the room today, don't worry, you can get a job with IBM. I started my career working for IBM, and they didn't appreciate design quite so much then. So I left quite quickly. And then, of course, there's people like the UK government that we've heard about. Um, and about the amazing work that they're doing. So there's lots of big players focusing on this stuff, but, the, but they are sm you know, small in number. If all of this stuff is so obvious, if the benefits of user experience are so obvious, if design thinking is so obviously great, then why aren't more companies doing it? Why are your clients not getting it? Why does your boss not understand? Well, in truth, it comes down to the fact that change is hard. And, and the kind of thing that we want to see in organizations is change. It means that they're making fundamental changes in the way they work, and that is difficult. Culture, leadership, and employee engagement is essential to creating great customer experiences, to adopting design thinking, to changing things. And the trouble is, we have poor leadership in most of the companies that we work for and with. That's the truth. And not poor in the fact that they're rubbish at their jobs, but poor in the sense that they don't understand that the world has changed around them. Because it has. When, when old people like me grew up and did our university training and went and did business degrees or whatever these managers did, they weren't, the internet didn't exist. They live in a mass media, mass market world that is so different that they're out of touch that they don't understand. They, they kind of know about Snapchat and, and Facebook because their nephew told them. They may even use social media and social networks. And they, you know, they adopt this technology, but they don't understand how it's changed people, how it's changed our behavior. So who's going to tell them if not us? 
But it's not just poor leadership. Our very companies are out uh, of date. We talked about Agile, didn't we, and how important Agile is. But that's really difficult when you've got these silo different parts of organizations. Marketing never talks to sales. You know, sales never talk to finance. IT, well, nobody talks to IT. I mean, why would you want to? So there's, there's these out of date structures as well that are causing all kinds of problems. But then there are also incompatible cultures, those unwritten rules that exist within companies about the way things are done or the way things are not done. So all of these things make most companies fundamentally out of touch. But we, we, not big management, but we can change those companies if we're willing to play the long game. And that's what I want to share with you today, is some ways that we can begin changing the companies with which we work. So, how do we go about doing that? Well, the number one is we need to stop being the isolated, grumpy designer, right? And we need to go out there and find other like-minded people. We sit there going, eh, user experience, eh, why does no one care, right? And we're all kind of grumpy and miserable about it, and we're all, oh, I'm, no one understands me. You know, no one understands design or the creative process. Why don't people appreciate my art? But in doing that, we just alienate. And instead, we need to go out and, and build bridges and, and find people that, that are just as passionate about creating a great experience as we are because they exist. They exist in every com uh, company. And the we reason I know that is because people are self-motivated. They, they're self-centered. So if you work within marketing, it's in your interest to care about the user experience. If you work in sales, it's in your interest to care about creating a great experience. Now, you might differ about the details of how to do that, but you are like-minded in that fine lane. So find like-minded people within your company. And if you can't find them in your company for whatever reason, then look outside. Things like this, these events, are great for meeting other people that you can share ideas with and talk with. Because if you try and do this on your own, you will flag, you will give up, you will fail. So that's the first thing I would encourage you to do, is start seeking out like-minded people. And ideally, like-minded people within your company and in other disciplines other than your own. Secondly, create a manifesto with those people, all right? Because we tend to be a little bit vague, right? We go, mm, you know, why doesn't anyone care about design? Why doesn't care people care about the user experience? And we moan a lot, but we don't actually positively suggest how things should be different. So with these like-minded people that you found with your organization, start establishing design principles, user experience principles. Begin to describe how your processes should work, how the user experience should be. This is an example from the US Digital Service, where they talk about the, under, the importance of understanding people's needs to address the whole experience, not just the individual project, to make things simple and intuitive. These are basic principles. And the great thing is with these, is if you start saying them enough, it's like an earworm. You start repeating things. If you sum up everything that you believe in these little nice niche statements like, digital first, design with data. You've heard all of these phrases, and they catch on. And before you know it, your colleagues in the organization, your client starts using some of these te uh, terms as well. Well, we really should be designing with data. You know? And that begins to change culture and stuff. So create a manifesto alongside your like-minded friends. So beyond that, start looking to raise the profile of the customer. Okay, whoever here has created a customer journey map? Raise your hands. All right, keep your hands up. If you haven't created a customer journey map, but you kept it, created a persona, put your hand up. Empathy maps? Okay, so we've got quite a few hands going up there, right? So most of us have created these kinds of things. They're absolutely vital because they begin to describe the user and the user's experience in more detail. But what happens after you've created them? Where are they now? 
My bet is they're in a drawer somewhere, or maybe even on a hard drive. They don't even exist in the real world. The trouble with these things is they're great, and we create them, and then we put them away. We maybe use them for one project, and then we forget the user. They need to become a fundamental part of how our organization operates. So I've got a challenge for you, right? Nobody has yet said, emailed me to say they've done this. So if you do this, what I'm about to suggest, please, please email me, because I think this is a really cool idea. What I want you to do is take your persona, take your user uh, story, uh, user journey, take um, your empathy map, make them pretty. You're designers, you can do that. That's easy, isn't it? Make them look pretty. Then f print them out big and frame them up. Get lots of copies of them, frame them up. Then what I want to do is one night break into your office, right? And creep around your office when no one else is there and take down every picture of people shaking hands and management posing and awards and buildings and all of that stuff, all that internal focus stuff we put on our walls, all that stuff that screams, we're great, and replace all of that with pictures of your customers, with personas, with that kind of thing. Now, MailChimp did this. MailChimp have got wonderful personas that they have it up in their offices everywhere. And it's a great way, so every time someone looks up from their desk, they're confronted with the user, the people that you're trying to reach, the people you're trying to please, the people you're trying to engage. And if you do it sneakily, by sneaking into work, then you begin to start a bit of a, a, bit of a, a discussion within the organization. Where did they come from? How, how, how did they get up there? What are they all about? And you're beginning to raise the profile of the customer. Now, there are hundreds of ways that you can do this, from doing regular newsletters within your organization to internal workshops like we, we've heard people talk about. There's so much potential to raise the, the, um, the the profile of the customers, and we as designers have to become the champion for that. So what else have we got? Well, alongside that, we also need to start creating a vision of the future. Again, like I said, we're terrible at moaning. We're terrible at saying that the current reality sucks. We're not where we're supposed to be. But then, let's present a better future, how things could be. Now, that might be a customer journey map. But it could equally be a prototype, something that we've built. Can you imagine being that guy in Disney that had to go to the board of directors and say, I've got this idea for a magic band, right? A magic band that will create an amazing experience, that will allow people to pay, um, to, uh, to pay for anything in the park using just their band without ever getting credit card out. A band that will enable you to um, open your hotel door. A band that means that Mickey will be able to come up to your daughter on the birthday and wish them happy birthday by name because we've got a record of who they are and where they are in the park. A band that will enable people to pre-order food and be greeted by the maitre d' by name as you walk up to the restaurant that you can sit anywhere you want in the restaurant and the food will just magically appear in front of you. That's what I've got in me. All I need is one billion dollars, right? Imagine being the person that said that. That isn't going to swing it, is it? You see, management spend their whole life turning down ideas. That's their job, right? So the way that they did this is they created a prototype. They got an empty lot, empty building, like this one. Yeah, well, probably not as fancy as this one. Um, and they built a cardboard version of the park with a cardboard hotel door and a cardboard um, ride and a cardboard everything else, right? And then management were invited to come in, and they had a bit of paper put around their wrist, and they were told to walk up to the cardboard hotel door and put their bit of paper by the cardboard hotel door, and then someone behind the door opens the door and goes beep, like that. Talk about hi-fi. But that was enough to convince them to begin to take that idea forward and to explore it more. You see, management can't always wrap their head around your great idea. It makes much, so much sense to you, but it doesn't to them. So we need to give them a vision. We need to show them what the future could be like, how it could be taken forward. We need to build a proof of concept. So once we've given them the vision and we've got them enthusiastic, don't suddenly ask them then to give you a, a billion dollars or ask them to give you a lot of time or a lot of money or anything else. Instead, say, well, let's just trial it in one little area. 
let's just try it in this bit and see how it works. Let's gather data relentlessly. Let's back up our idea with real numbers. The trouble is, is we rush in with the big idea, wanting big change all of a sudden, and we overwhelm people with it. Just ask for something small, lots of small steps that move people forward. Now, actually, in my book, I go on to cover a whole range of other things that you could do. But what just one other is to start focusing on culture. Again, start establishing these little mantras that begin to shift the culture. Things like, you know, we, we, I believe in making new mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes and do that kind of thing. Begin to shift the culture over time. So, there's so much that I could say and I, do, I would love to say. But what I want to do is, because we've got limited time, I just want to give you 10 quick fire suggestions, 10 practical things that you can do to begin shifting your culture. And uh, what I've done, actually, with the book that's coming out in a um, couple of months, or even less now, um, uh, we're doing a set of cards that go with them of just really quick, practical things that you can do to bring about change. Um, and I want to share just my favorite with you, really. Right, okay, so let's go. Number one, show, don't tell. This principle that you're visual thinkers, right? You can picture things in your mind. And it's amazing that you can do that. And that's a great talent. But we take it for granted. We think everyone can do it. They can't. A lot of people actually need to see something before they can get on board with it, can understand it. So we need to do things like prototype. We need to visualize the user journey rather than just talk about it. We need to get colleagues completing user tasks. I'll give you an example, right? I worked on a website once um, for where the average audience was in their 80s, right? Imagine designing a website for an 80-year-old. Now, to be fair, their children sometimes bought the food on their behalf, but their children were in the 60s, right? So a very old audience. Now, the people, that, the, the marketing people that I was working with, the marketing guy I was working with was quite a young guy, you know, quite hip, right? And he just couldn't get wrap his head around this, right? He couldn't wrap his head around um, the challenges. And so the design that was produced was all subtle and nice, and the links, you know, beautifully, beautiful links with subtle gray underlines and subtle text against a subtle background. And he couldn't understand why I was saying that that was rubbish and wasn't applicable and wouldn't work for this elderly audience. So in the end, out of sheer frustration, I came into the office one day with a pair of reading glasses and some ski gloves. And I said, put on those reading glasses because that will mimic the vision that most 80-year-olds have. And put on those ski gloves because that will mimic the arthritis that most of your audience have. Now try using your sodding website. And then suddenly he got it because he could see it, experience it, feel it, touch it. Well, he couldn't touch it. That was a problem. He couldn't use the mouse properly. So by recreating the experience, you could really kind of get people on board. So show, don't tell. Next up, get colleagues in front of users. I cannot stress this enough. Who does usability testing here? Put your hands in your air. That is appalling. The people that put your hands in the air, you are great human beings. You're a great human being. Well done. Everyone else, you should burn in hell. Right? Sorry, was that overstating it? You should move to America. They like your type over there these days. No. Um, but usability testing should be a fundamental part of our approach. And do you know what? Usability testing is totally worth your time and effort. Because the amount of time you spend arguing with your client, Right? The amount of time you've been debating about what the best approach is, just put it in front of users. Run to, and, and, and everything will change the minute your customers start sitting in front of real users, really interacting with your products and services. So run open usability test sessions every week. There's a great book by a guy called Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think. You should all read that if you've not done user testing before. It will totally convince you that it's worth doing. But he wrote a follow-up book called Rocket Surgery Made Easy. And in the follow-up book, he suggests that basically once a month, you should run usability testing no matter what you're doing. Whatever's going on, you should just test. And you do it on the same day every month. You do it in the morning. You test three people once a month. And you make that an open usability test session. So you invite your clients, you invite your colleagues, you invite stakeholders. You bribe them to come along saying, we'll give you a nice lunch afterwards. 
And you get them in the room and you get them watching. And I promise you, as soon as they see real users using your site, they'll get it. It'll change. No more arguments, no more debates, just show them it. If you can't get them in the room, record the sessions and then edit it down to a low lights reel of the pain and misery that they're um, experiencing with their current website and how yours makes it better. Maybe even take it a, a bit further like the government digital service do and make them mandatory. The government digital service says you have to spend two hours every six weeks watching usability sessions and if you don't, you don't get a say in the project. That certainly mix things up a bit, wouldn't it? And we also, the other thing we do as designers is we work like this. Give me, give me your brief. Okay, I've got your brief. Bye. No, no, you can't look yet. No, I'm not finished. Give me, give me a while. 30 hours later. Okay. Ta-da! And that just does not work. It's the worst thing you can do ever. Because the client feels no sense of ownership, right? They don't feel that it's their design. They don't feel they participated in any way. So it's easy to slag it off, isn't it? Also, people don't like surprises. Whatever you show them, no matter how good it is, will not be what they expected, what they had in their head, and therefore they won't like it. So make your life so much easier and include stakeholders as you produce design. Do things like workshop the customer journey to get them thinking about users' needs, to get them thinking about where the website fits into the project and that kind of thing. Do collaborative wireframing with the clients where you get them involved in the wireframing process because all the time you're teaching them at the same time. Do something called the user attention point exercise. I haven't got time to tell you what it is, but I'm going to anyway. So the user attention point exercise is a really simple exercise. You know how everybody wants to cram everything on the home page, right? And everybody's arguing about what to put on a page. Well, what you do is you get all of those people into a room and you say, write down everything you can possibly think of to add to the home page, right? Search boxes, carousels, news stories, quick links, whatever they want to do. Or get, let them get it all out of their system rather than you being the grumpy designer that goes, no, you can't have that. No, that's too much. No, you'll make the design look messy. No, I'm the designer. I went to art college. Listen to me, right? Just let them get it all out of their system. And then once they've done that, Say to them, well, there's quite a lot of stuff here, isn't there? Because you can be at 50 or 60 items easily. And you say to them, OK, so we all know that users have got limited attention. You've got limited attention. Everybody gets that, that they only look at it. So let's represent that user attention with 17 points, right? Now go away and spend those 17 points on what you want to include on the home page. If you want somebody to look more at one item than another, give it more points. So if you want people to look more at the carousel than they look at, I don't know, the logo, give it two points rather than one, all right? Yes, there they get that. So away they go, and they go through this exercise. Now, immediately, you framed the discussion. You framed it around users' needs and users' attention rather than their internal focus. And they go away, and they do it, and they go one, two, one, three, one. Oh, no, I'm running out of points. That's three. Let's make that one. Go like this. And in the end, you'll have one, two, one, 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 two, one, 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 two, right? They'll really spread their points really thin. And you get back together as a group and you say, great job, guys. You've really narrowed it down because they've had to get a lot out of it. He said, but there's just one problem. All of your numbers are very similar to one another. Let me show you something. And you show them the Google homepage and you show them the Yahoo homepage. And you say, which is better out of the two? Now, unless there's a smart aleck in the room, Everybody says Google, right? Of course Google's better. He said, well, the trouble is you've just designed Yahoo. Because Yahoo spreads their points over all these different items, while Google spends, spread, uh, spends all of their points on the search box. And do you know what? That really simple thing is like a light bulb in people's heads. Now they get it. Now they understand. And you get them to redo the exercise, and they'll make the tough decisions. And do you know what? You haven't had to argue with them once through the whole thing. Instead, you've educated them. And education is always a better approach. So we need to become educators. We think it's our job to build stuff. But do you know what? Builders, people that design, I'm sorry, you're two a penny. 
right? Everybody thinks they can design. So the perception is, is design is cheap, design is easy. But what we need to change that perception. And that means our industry and our clients and our colleagues, the primary thing they need from us is us to be educators, to teach people about the value of design, to teach people about user experiences. We need to start using those guerrilla tactics I talked about with the posters. We need to start writing blogs and newsletters, not to our peers, not showing off to one another, but to our clients and our colleagues and, and our other stakeholders. We need to start running lunchtime presentations, not to teach each other shit, but to teach our clients and colleagues stuff that they need to know. Maybe even go as far as bring, uh, running an internal conference with a dashing, handsome external speaker coming in. Maybe somebody who wears very nice jackets and, and isn't foreign, like whatever Vitali is. I don't know, where do you come from? I've never actually asked. Some obscure Eastern European little place, isn't it? Yeah. Probably we owned it at some point, I would have thought. So, <laughs> that's not politically correct. I'm sounding like Jeremy Clarkson. So, in all of this, target the selfish gene, right? All the time, we go to management and, we s and colleagues and we say, look, we want you to... Take the user experience properly. Uh, take it seriously. We want you to take design seriously. But you know what? You're wasting your time. Jacob Nielsen, uh, Jared Spall wrote a great post saying, why I can't convince your executive of anything and neither can you. You're never going to change management or your colleagues' minds. Right? But what he goes on to say in that article is although you can't change their minds, you can latch on to what they already care about. Do they care about meeting targets? Do they care about their end of year bonus? Do they care about whatever? And the chances are that design and great user experience can help fulfill almost every one of those needs. So instead of pushing your agenda, piggyback on theirs. Find out what they care about and prove to them that design can make a difference. Show them that you can help with whatever they're struggling over and you'll find them a lot more receptive. Rely on data. We need to establish a new mandate where we say, well, let's test that. So when a client comes back to you or a colleague comes back to you and says, I don't like what you've done, do this instead. Go, don't get all uptight because you've spent 30 hours on the design. Don't throw the, you know, do the whole kind of, well, I went to art college, I'm the expert. You're wasting your time. Instead, you say, well, let's test it. Let's take my design, I'll make some tweaks to, you know, so it matches what you've got in mind. Let's throw it out there and see what happens. If you establish this less test it um, mantra, it will work so much better. But of course, to do that, you need to know what your key performance indicators are. How do you measure success? How do you know what it is you want um, people to do? And we need to spend time encouraging um, our clients and colleagues to establish that. Right. The other thing that we can do is, uh, is attach what we do to overall company strategy. You know that document that got sent around at your business? You know, that company strategy is normally a 2020 vision at the moment. Everybody has a 2020 vision because it sounds cool because it's 2020 and it's vision. Aren't they clever? Managers are so clever coming up with this stuff. Well done then. Um, so they write some boring ass document about goals and objectives and all this kind of crap and you just take it and you shove it in the drawer or if the, you know, if the, the um, shredder is nearby, you put it straight in that, but you know, it's really not worth the effort to get up and go to the shredder for something that's so piffling and annoying. So you just shove it somewhere and forget about it. Well, pick that document because although it's full of vague guff, right? It has a value because if you can associate whatever you want to do, whatever user experience thing you want to achieve, if you can associate it with one of those points in that document, suddenly it's got more credibility because instead of pushing your own agenda, you're just facilitating management's goals. Doesn't that sound better? Aren't they going to be more receptive to that? So start associating what you do with the, um, with the company's overall objectives. And the one thing that all of us can do is we can control the way we work, right? Nobody says, when you join a company, nobody, you know, on day one, they don't say to you, look, you know, we recognize you're the creative, uh, the creative skill here, but uh, in this company, we dictate that everybody uses Microsoft Paint, right? 
That is, that is our company of choice. You make decisions all the time about the way you work, don't you? Right? What tools you use, you know, what your process is, that kind of stuff. So use that to your advantage. Start dictating some things that encourages good design practice. Right? Instead of beginning, instead of people coming to you with a big ass list of stuff we want, right? A functional spec with, oh, well, we need a calendar that does this, or we need this that does that. Instead, start by asking about user tasks. Well, tell me what users are going to do on this site. What are users' objectives are? Start from a different premise. Maybe make testing mandatory, like I mentioned earlier, if you can get away with it. Say, look, we just do testing as part of our process, just like we use Sketch. Or, oh, no, sorry, like we use Adobe's excellent range of products that you should all be using. So, you know, you, did, you use the tools you want. Your process should be what you want. You always have to test. You cannot do your job without testing. It's just the way things are, right? And then establish some design principles around which you work, how you make decisions, formalize it. Because at the moment, you know what most people think about you? They think you make this shit up as you go along, right? They think you just have an artistic mu muse at one moment and then scribble some stuff down. That's what people think. Now, let's be honest, to some degree, we do do that. Some degree, all of that design stuff that we've learned works in our subconscious. And so we do very things very intuitively a lot of the time. But that doesn't help to validate us as a profession. So instead, actually write down some design principles so people understand how you work and how you operate. And focus on close collaboration. Interview colleagues. Embed a client in your team. Consider doing design sprints that I think we heard about yesterday. All of these things, A, help educate the client but most importantly, gives them a sense of ownership. It makes them feel that they've helped create the product. And if they feel they've um, been a part of creating the product, they're not going to say their own ideas are shit. They're not going to reject their own work. And they're going to defend it to that, you know that senior manager who swoops and poops? Do you know what I mean? He swoops into the project three quarters of the way through and just takes a shit all over it. Right? And whoever your point of contact is goes, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, right? But if that person feels invested in it, if they've collaborated and been involved with it, then they're more likely to grow a spine and stick up for your project, stick up for the work that's been done. There are so many potentials. Make use of dashing outside experts to bring validity to what you say. Do you know 90% of my job is just going into organizations and saying exactly what their internal team has said. But because I'm an outside expert, because I'm paid a lot of money, people listen to me, and I am incredibly expensive. So management take me seriously as a result, and it makes a huge difference. Now, if you can't afford someone as dashing and handsome as me, then your alternative is to buy books and reference those, to reference talks like you're hearing today, to, to, to use other outside opinions. Because it, you become experts by association. You prove that you know your stuff. You can quote research and experts in the field. You've got data to back up what you do. It adds credibility to who you are. So remember that this is a long game. It's a fight doing this kind of stuff. It will be hard getting buy-in, but it is worth it. It is a battle worth fighting. Because we can fundamentally change our businesses and our organizations. And the, the phrase I want to leave you with, the little quote I want to leave you with, to fire you up, to keep you going, is something that Winston Churchill apparently didn't say, even though... I thought he did say it, and I built my whole life around it. So, which is the phrase, um, success is going from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And that's what I want to leave you with. I want to encourage you to fight and push and change your organizations, that you will get knocked down, but you'll get up again. And that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you very much.